Greetings, fellow Gorehounds, and welcome back to a Blood Splattered Vlog. I'm the Horror Guru, and today I'm going to talk about a movie called Vampires vs. the Bronx, which is a Netflix original horror film that recently hit the platform. And it's basically a kids' adventure horror film in the vein of something like Fright Night or Monster Squad, but with the twist being, instead of being set in a white suburban neighborhood, it's set in the inner city Bronx. Which naturally gives the movie its own flavor and sets it apart from the pack, because giving it a different location like that means there's going to be cultural differences in the way the characters interact with their threats. Because naturally, a kid raised in an urban environment is going to have a very different reaction to perceived threats than a kid raised in a suburban environment. And there's a lot of cool things this movie does to play with those differences that I personally thought were really fucking inspired. <laughs> And as if that wasn't enough to give this movie its own unique identity, the filmmakers also saw to giving this film a deeper meaning beyond just being a fun kids film. Because you see, the vampires in this movie don't just represent like literal vampires. They also represent the very real world threat of gentrification. But that right there is a subject that I'm going to save for the spoiler section. So if you want to know more about that, then you're going to have to wait. So putting aside the politics of this movie for a second, the thing I want to talk about before we get to the real shit is how fucking fun this movie is. It's a movie about these thoroughly entertaining and highly relatable kids trying to protect their neighborhood from these encroaching vampires. And they're basically going about their vampire hunting in the style of like the Frog Brothers from Lost Boys. So they're constantly scheming these plans to deal with the vampires using the tools they have on hand, all the while bickering with one another in hilarious ways. The dialogue for these kids is so authentic that I felt like I was sitting there with them as one of their friends helping them fight these vampires. Which is such the perfect note to hit for this movie because that's what all the best kids adventure horror films did. And honestly, any movie that makes me feel like a little kid again gets an automatic thumbs up. And there's some truly unique things this movie did that I haven't seen any movie like it do before. And probably the best example of that being how in this movie, the kids, when they're trying to figure out how to deal with these vampires, they're constantly referencing the movie Blade and not like Dracula and like the classic vampire movies. Because like, think about it, when you've seen vampire movies reference other vampire movies, how many times have you seen one of those movies reference Blade? I could probably fit all the vampire movies that do on one hand. <laughs> Which is super fucking weird when you think about it, because Blade is one of the best action horror movies ever fucking made, and probably one of the most badass vampire hunters ever put to screen. So I can't believe it took until now for me to actually see a movie reference Blade the same way we see people reference Dracula in movies, or The Lost Boys, or even Twilight. Every other vampire movie references those movies. In fact, this year, I reviewed a couple vampire movies that all reference those movies. So I guess what I'm saying is kudos to this movie for finally giving Blade the recognition it deserves. Because Blade fucking rocks. But there's a lot of other cool things this movie does. Like, this is one of the few movies that actually utilizes technology really well when it comes to vampires. Because I've seen so many vampire movies recently that kind of exist in this weird nebulous void of, like, existing in, like, a timeline somewhere around, like, the 80s to early 90s, but never actually stating that's where they're set. And a lot of movies do this for two reasons. Number one, the nostalgia factor, which is really fucking strong for people my age. But the second reason so many movies do this is they don't want to deal with the X factor of cell phones. Not this movie, though. This movie 100% exists within the here and now. So there are cell phones, there's social media, and there are people obsessed with both things. When you see this movie for yourself, you're going to know exactly who I'm talking about. And so naturally, given that the kids in this movie have access to such technology, the kind of stuff that didn't exist in the days of Fright Night or Monster Squad, that means they get to discover new ways in which vampires and technology mix and don't mix. Which leads to some great moments in the movie that I don't want to spoil just yet. Again, you're going to have to wait. Now, with all that said, I do have some criticisms. And they really all come down to the fact that this movie was obviously a low-budget film, and there are times in which that budget shows more than others. Mainly every time the vampires vamp out, the vampire makeup leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> they look like some of the lesser makeup jobs on 90s TV shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Which, to be fair, that show had some great makeup at times, but there are other times in which it had lesser makeup. <laughs> 
And on top of that, the movie likes to use this speed ramping effect every time the vampires are using their super speed. And it looks television quality. It does not look feature film quality. And I can live with that because I watch a lot of TV that uses similar effects. But if you're expecting something a little bit more, you know, like a higher production value, then uh, you might be a little put off by it. Like, I feel really bad saying this, but there are times in which the vampires do that weird speed ramping effect thing, and they kind of look like they're extras in the movie The Covenant, which, yikes. But here's the thing about this. Even though this is a flaw of the movie and I acknowledge it, it honestly didn't bug me too much while I was watching the movie because I was having way too much fun. I was too engaged in the characters and I thought them picking off the vampires one by one was so fun. It didn't really matter to me if the vampires themselves were a little laughable. But because your results may vary, I've decided to warn you up front. Anyway, if that criticism worries you, then worry not because uh, this movie, it stars Method Man as a priest, which is uh, pretty fucking cool if you ask me. And one last thing before we move on to the spoilers, um, you know that kid in the movie, the um, uh, not the main character, but uh, one of his friends, the um, the one with the glasses and uh, the ghost shirt and uh, the Slayer shirt and um, reading Salem's Lot at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, that kid, um, that kid was my motherfucking dude. And uh, I related to him hardcore throughout this entire movie. And uh, I hope that he gets a sequel all onto his own, because uh, he deserves it. Anyway, my fellow Gorehounds, Vampires vs. the Bronx is currently available on Netflix. If you want to watch it, you're going to have to subscribe to Netflix and go see it for yourself. Um, I'm not sponsored by Netflix. I'm just a pretty big fan. And with all that said, let us finally move on to the spoilers. All right, so to make this perfectly clear, we are currently in the spoiler section. If you do not want to be spoiled on what happens in the movie, then pause right here, go watch the movie on Netflix, and then come back and finish the vlog then. All right, so you've seen the movie now? All right, good. Now that we're on the same page, let us continue. So as I alluded to earlier in this review, this movie's about more than just kids fighting vampires. It's also about a very real world problem. And that problem is gentrification. But if you don't know what that means, then give me a brief moment to explain as best as I can. Basically, gentrification is the process by which a poor neighborhood is slowly transformed into a middle class neighborhood. But in the process of doing that, it ends up pushing out all the poor people that previously lived there. So it's no longer the neighborhood it once was. It's now a whole new slew of people who can actually afford to live there. And this process happens in a variety of ways. You have, first and foremost, the over-policing of poor neighborhoods to clean up the riffraff, with the riffraff often including homeless people who are just down on their luck and used to live in the neighborhood but no longer can afford it because of all the other reasons I'm going to get into. You then have the landlords who realize that they can get more money off of the middle class people, so they jack up their rental prices, effectively pushing all the people that currently live in the neighborhood out of the neighborhood, which in turn, without all those poor people around, the middle class people are more likely to move in because there's a lot of class prejudice happening here. As well as racial prejudice, as in America, this often happens to neighborhoods that are of color. And then you got the rich corporations that come in with their big corporate overlord shops, you know, your targets and shit like that. And the local businesses can't possibly compete with that, so they all slowly go away or get bought up by the big corporation. And this is on top of many local businesses being bought out and replaced with upper scale versions of that business by someone else that the poor people who used to live in that neighborhood can no longer afford to shop at. And long story short, the people that originally lived in that neighborhood, the poor people, are pushed out of that neighborhood into other neighborhoods where the cycle rinses and repeats in those neighborhoods. So, you know, where can the poor people live? Um, not in my backyard. Now, for the few of you out there who have not seen the movie yet, you're probably wondering to yourselves, um, how does a complicated socioeconomic problem like that manifest itself in a dumb movie about kids fighting vampires? Which is a totally fair question, so allow me to explain how it does. Basically, one of the first things we're introduced to in this movie is that there's a real estate firm that is currently buying up all the local businesses within the Bronx. And we find out over the course of the movie, the reason all these businesses are being bought out is because the landlords are jacking up their prices and the local businesses can no longer afford to stay in business. 
which is demonstrated in this movie by the main character trying to rally the neighborhood together to do a fundraiser to save one of his friend's businesses. And this is all established in the first 20 minutes of the movie, so already we've set the stage for this movie being about gentrification. But that is just a set dressing, because where this movie really gets into the actual social commentary is when it comes to the vampires. Because remember a few minutes ago when I alluded to the fact that gentrification is something that disproportionately affects neighborhoods of color? Because you see, there's another side to that coin. There's the people actually doing the gentrifying, the people moving into the neighborhood, as well as the people that are pouring all the money into the neighborhood to get the poor people out. And I'm just saying, those people are often not people of color themselves. Now, with all that established, here's where the movie gets to its most biting commentary. Because you see, the people doing the gentrifying in this movie are the vampires. You know, the aristocratic pale bloodsuckers. And as the movie goes on, the movie gets more and more pointed with its commentary as you start to discover why the vampires are doing this in the first place. Because basically the plan is to gentrify the neighborhood and in the process of doing that, feed on all the poor people. And by feeding on all the poor people, they're essentially feeding on the people that are leaving the neighborhood anyway. And no one gives a shit in the first place because they're poor. Ouch, that commentary bites so hard I feel it right in my neck. And here's the thing, the movie could have stopped right there and still been a perfect piece of social commentary, but it decides to go even deeper than that. Because you see, in this movie, there's a vampire familiar who's basically the Renfield of the film. He's the person that does all the vampires' dirty work in the daylight while they're asleep. And of course, like all familiars in vampire movies, he's constantly striving to get the approval of the vampires so that they may bite him and he may join them. Which, given the socio-political context of this movie, makes him the corporate bootlicker who is selling out the poor neighborhood so that he may go from being a poor person to being among the rich, the vampires, the elite. And in my favorite scene in the whole movie, there's a point in which the main characters point out to him that the vampires are not going to give him what he wants. He is just a means to an end. Once they get what they want, he's just going to be food like everyone else in the neighborhood. So he's basically selling his soul for nothing because he's still an ant to them. He's never going to be a vampire. It's a lost cause. It's a lie they told him. And goddamn, if that doesn't relate to real-world economic issues, then I don't know what does. Anyway, my fellow Gorehounds, this vlog is running way too goddamn long, but there is one last thing I want to say and one last thing I want to praise in this movie, and that's the scene in the film in which the kids try to sneak into, like, the vampire nest, and they record all the vampires sleeping in their nests, and then they try to show the neighborhood, and I love this scene because I did not see it coming, but, like, they, they pull out the camera, and they try to show it to everyone, but the vampires don't appear on the film because... It's a reflection. So th because like in, in a camera, I don't know if you know this, but in a camera, it's it, you, the way you record things in a camera is through mirrors and shit. So th they're mirrors. So the vampires don't appear in the fucking film. And I thought that was fucking genius. I know I've seen that before in like a couple movies, but this was a movie that I think used it like the best. And with all that said, my fellow Gorehounds, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell so that you're notified of my videos immediately upon their upload. Also, be sure to check out my Patreon page, and if you decide to go the Patreon route, know that even a dollar a month can go a long way. <laughs> and with all that said, my fellow Gorehounds, I'm sweating up a goddamn storm, so I'm gonna go take a shower, and, uh, peace out. <laughs>